It is an honor to be here and to speak into the listening of all of you who have gathered and really come here for a deeper conversation and how that deeper conversation uh, interfaces uh, with the tech industry specifically. So what I'd like to do first is to take a moment and let's close the outer eye so that the inner eye can open. And we see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. And we watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger. Until now, it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. And we see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. And we see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are. For we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of all that is holy and all that is true. And it is to that power which resides within us that we dedicate our time together and our experiences of one another. And we ask to be lifted above and beyond the limitations and fears that are the thought forms of this world to the love and to the peace that lay beyond. <clears throat> and so it is, we say. I'd like to begin this morning by talking about love and organization. There's been a lot of talk at this conference about organizations and how to create them and how to run them, how to lead them, how to run them. And I want to start by giving a metaphysical appraisal. You know, metaphysics is the study of that which is beyond the physical. And it has to do with universal spiritual themes that are at the heart of all the great religious and philosophical teachings. Now, from a metaphysical perspective, the universe is an organization. The universe is perfectly organized. All this talk about organizations, let's talk for a moment what happens as an embryo grows into a baby. You have these two, you have an egg and you have a sperm. And all of a sudden, these miraculous things begin to occur. A brain is formed, skin is formed, blood is formed, a spleen is formed, toenails are formed. The embryo becomes the baby. Look at the organization in nature. Look how a bud becomes a blossom. Look how, an, look how an acorn becomes an oak tree. So the universe, and we see this throughout nature, is already programmed to organize itself. And you can see in nature that nature organizes itself always in the direction of that which survives and thrives. Now the metaphysical perspective is that this organizing principle of nature is not just inherent in the material world but that the universe itself on every level is self-organizing and on every level is moving in the direction of that which survives and thrives. In other words, the universe is intentional. <clears throat> so this intentional universe uses whatever is offered to it to move forward that which survives and thrives. The difference between you and me and the embryo, the difference between you and me and the bud, the difference between you and me and the acorn is that you and I, can say no. In nature, there doesn't seem to be a choice. You and I are free beings. We can say, use me, cosmic intention, to bring forth that which is loving, that which is good, that which is surviving, that which is thriving, use me. Or I can say, no, I don't want to. Now that in nature, by the way, is called cancer. Cancer cell is the cell which has said, I don't want to just contribute to the healthy functioning of the whole thing. I want to go off and do my own thing. And then I will gather other equally sick cells around me. And that, of course, is a malignancy. And so from a metaphysical perspective, the human race, the consciousness of the human race, in too many cases has become malignant. We are doing our own thing forgetting that our own self-actualization 
is part of the larger self-actualization of the species in the larger whole and system of which we live. <clears throat> so just as in medicine, when doctors, let's say, do something like make a, an artificial heart, in medicine it is understood that what they are trying to do is mimic nature, the perfection of which cannot possibly be matched by the human mind. And in organizations, the same is true that at the highest level we are seeking to mimic nature, and we mimic nature by being co-creative with nature. Just as a missile, every thought is a missile, and just as in the physical world a missile delivers a warhead, in the spiritual world any thought, a thought of love, is like a missile that delivers a peacehead. Now, that's why all of this talk about compassion is important, and that is why it is so important in the running of an organization or any system, because when we Enter in, when you drop in, you know, we were talking that first night about being and then doing. You drop down, God drops in. You drop down, the creativity drops in whatever words we want to use. And when that happens, the issue is not just what happens when we move into the state of being. Remember, we've been talking here a lot about, <clears throat> you know, a, a, a Western consciousness, a Western mind disconnected from its true nature, has skipped the state of being, has skipped the state of being and gone right into doing. And so what we're talking about here today, have been talking about all weekend, is balancing by going into being. <clears throat> but it is equally unbalanced to think about your being and not to think about what you're doing. And so I want to talk to you this morning about what emanates from, what emanates from the conscious mind. We've talked about getting to the conscious mind. We've talked about the stress reduction. We've talked about mindfulness and how it moves to greater and deeper relationship and it causes greater compassion for employees and employers, all of which is true. I mean, if you really want your organization to work, you really want your business to work, send, before you even go to work, send peace to your employers, send peace to your employees, send peace to your customers, or pray for their happiness, whatever words are true for you. But the universe, in the way it works as a self-actualizing mechanism, does not stop there. <clears throat> now, this is something that has not been talked about here. But from a spiritual perspective, it's very important. And this is where mindfulness and spirituality are two different conversations. Mindfulness has been talked about by some of truly the greats here. And I want to say, I don't know if they're here now, Jack Kornfield and John Kabat-Zinn and Joan Halifax. What an honor to just be in your presence. What an honor to, to be with you. <clears throat> And to, to see, as I'm sure you have seen, and to really take in what you have, the ground that you have prepared, the generation that you have helped to raise that can bring the kind of mindfulness and consciousness that is here already. So I just want to take this time to acknowledge you, honor to be your colleague, give that audience an opportunity to applaud you once again. The rest of you don't get too comfortable because I need to talk to you about something. <clears throat> now this is the deal. There is, in every spiritual story, in every religious theme, there is another side than all this love stuff. In Buddhism, it's simply defined as ignorance. You know, it's interesting about the Eastern and the Western traditions. The, the, the gift of the East to humanity is our ability to accept things. The gift of the West to humanity is our ability to change things. And that yin and yang, that duality, that mix of the Eastern and the Western, we can accept it, we can take it in, and also we can change it when it needs to be changed. That is the whole total balance cosmology. Now, I told myself years ago, <clears throat> there's no such thing as a devil. Don't worry about a devil, Marianne. That's all in your mind. And then I realized, shit, that is the worst place it could possibly be. From a metaphysical perspective, we don't think there's some devil out there that is stalking the planet, trying to get people's souls. But what we do believe, and the evidence proves it, and I want to talk to you about its evidence here this weekend, is that there is a temptation and a tendency within all of us to perceive without love. Now what we have in the West is this myth of neutrality. Well, I mean, I'm not trying to make people's lives better, but I mean, I don't want to hurt anybody. 
And the truth of the matter is on a consciousness level, any thought that is not proactively intending love is proactively intending chaos. <clears throat> now we talked about how the universe is intentional. Love is intentional. If you have a conscious organization, that's not the end. It's like it has been said here by some of the best and the brightest already this weekend, money is a means to an end. So you're having a successful organization in which people are happy. That is just the beginning. And so just as loving thought is intentional and proactive, any thought that is not loving, I used to say during the 60s, if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Because any thought that is not intending love is actually working, if even on a subconscious level, proactively promoting fear and chaos. There's harmony, there's chaos, there's love and fear. There is no real neutral ground. <clears throat> now it's interesting bringing spiritual types uh, such as myself here to a conference like this. You know, the Protestant uh, theologian Reinhold Niebuhr said, it is the job of the church, he said, not that I in any way represent the church, he said, though, it is the job of the church to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So there are some things to be discussed here because the truth of the matter is there's the hot devil and there's the cold devil. <clears throat> There's the, ah, uh, you know, as a Course in Miracles student, we don't use words like devil. We use a word like ego. Some people use shadow. I did a weekend with my, my beloved friend, Robert Thurman, who is a Tibetan Buddhist scholar of the highest sort. We do the mystical Buddha, the mystical Christ. I assure you it's all the same thing. But the point here is, just as they say in recovery, that addiction is insidious and cunning. Addiction is one form that the ego mind takes, and it is very insidious and it is very cunning. People are smart here. Freud said intelligence will be used in the service of the neurosis. The ego mind is the self-destructive, ultimately all-encompassing destructive force of the universe in all of our minds. It is your self-hatred, but it does not come up to you and say, hi, I'm your self-hatred. Quite the opposite. <clears throat> You're too smart for that. And this is your own brilliance used against you. So let me talk about the hot devil and let's talk about the cold devil. The hot devil, the hot ego. That's, we all know what that is. That's that which would lead us to kill people, to make people suffer, to actually do that which makes them suffer. But I want to talk to you about the cold devil. I want to talk to you about that force which does not announce it as that which does not lead you to kill people, but it leads you to ignore the fact that so many people suffer in your presence. And let me tell you something. You might talk about mindfulness, and that is legitimate here, but don't think it's a spiritual conversation because there is no legitimate spiritual conversation that does not address this suffering, the needless suffering of other sentient beings. <clears throat> The tech industry, the tech industry, one of America's prides and joys, one of the vortexes of power, one of the vortexes of possibility like nothing else on this planet, hundreds of billions of dollars. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, no spiritual leader person is going to come here and be a dancing monkey to help a bunch of rich capitalists talk about the fact that they can have a more compassionate workplace and meditation rooms while not dealing with the moral calling and the moral invitation of our species to deal with the fact that we have so much and so many have so little. That's not our job. <clears throat> John Cabot then said, well, what's wisdom one? Uh, one? A meditation room in your building, the fact that we all meditate, the fact that we're more compassionate towards each other, that's important. But to be spiritual, let me tell you something, it takes more than just taking long pauses between speakers. It takes more than integrating the information that's given by people you already agree with anyway. If we had more time here, I'd have you integrate some information. I would lead a meditation where you were integrating the suffering of a mother who is holding her starving child. That's the information you and I have to integrate. 
You know, Buddha would not have become enlightened had he not jumped over the wall of his father's compound and seen human suffering for the first time. There is no great religious story, there is no great spiritual story that does not include addressing human suffering. Only in modern America, because we come up with some ersatz version of, of spirituality that gives us a pass on addressing the hu unnecessary human suffering in our myth. Now, this does not mean we are to feel bad, to feel, well, actually, I take that back. We're to feel bad for a minute. We don't want to be sociopaths. We don't want to be people who don't feel the, the immense suffering of so many people on this planet. I mentioned the other night, 17,000 children die of hunger every single day. They starve to death. 35,000 people in total. One billion people on this planet live on a dollar and 25 cents and less a day. Above there, called deep poverty. Above that, you have one billion people living on two dollars and less a day. There is unnecessary human suffering on this planet. And it's, it is either a moral universe or it is not. So this hanging out in this neutral zone, and by the way, only helping on the periphery is not enough either. You know, there was a story, there was a story told by a Protestant theologian several years ago, which I think of as the difference between a good Samaritan and a conscious Samaritan. The good Samaritan sees a beggar on the road, gives him alms. Sees another beggar on the road, gives him alms. Sees another beggar on the road and gives him alms. The conscious Samaritan, after seeing enough of them, says, how come there are so many beggars? Ladies and gentlemen, the tech industry, do you know what could happen and would happen in this world and on this planet if Yahoo and Facebook and Cisco and Twitter and Google all got together and said, okay, this global poverty thing, 10 years, it's done. <laughs> You want, to have, you want to have a real wisdom conference, a wisdom that moves not past intentions are not enough. Good intentions are not enough. The Course in Miracles says good intentions are not enough. Willingness is everything. What I would like to see is major tech people get together with someone like economist Jeffrey Sachs, who is from Columbia University, who has established that within 10 years for $100 billion, we could eradicate deep poverty from the planet. That's one-seventh of what the United States spends every year on military. Let me tell you something. The U.S. government apparently isn't doing it. You guys could do it. You guys could do it. You guys could do it. And that is what is so amazing. And so from a spiritual perspective, you know, it's interesting. We always have to be checking in on ourselves. It was so interesting for me listening to this business about children and mindfulness. Children in mindfulness. I, I love, there's been a lot this weekend. I, it's been funny for me to hear all these people saying that they have scientific evidence that proves that the scientific mind is not all that is. And so we have this science, so we have scientific evidence of what mindfulness does in the mind of a child. Do you want mindfulness? Do you want mindfulness in our society? Help these children have their parents at home. Not only the fact that we don't have maternal leave or paternal leave that is paid for, we're going backwards, Melissa Meyer. Marissa Meyer, what is it with this woman? This is the tech industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your ground. I don't know this woman. I'm sure she's a lovely woman, but I can tell you this. Her saying that those who work for Yahoo cannot be at home anymore must come into the office. I will tell you this is a feminist for a long time. For, to have a woman, finally, who is the CEO of a major Fortune 500 company and says that people cannot be home with their children, they must come into the office or quit, this is not why we fought the revolution. And you know what? Oh, you should get online about that. That's what you should get online about. Draw that line in the sand. Girls, get on it. So we have to look at our own selves. This is true as individuals, and it is true as institutions, and it is true as a country. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is, if you could even afford to be at this conference, you know, rich, when I say rich, I don't just mean the moguls. I mean anybody who could even afford to be at this conference. I mean anybody who can even afford a computer. Listen, capitalism's been good to me. I'm happy. Because if you're in the club, this is a great place to live. But ladies and gentlemen, fewer and fewer people are able to get into the club these days. And it is an unsustainable situation on the planet. It is an unsustainable situation on the planet. <clears throat> And more and more people, more and more people are now talking about how it's an urgent moment, and yet we remain as paralyzed as ever. 
And so I hope that this conversation of what is truly wise will continue. But it moves beyond just the, the gift of the West and also the gift of the East and also includes the gift of the West and includes that amazing partnership. Because that's what the tech industry does represent, interestingly enough. The tech industry does represent the beauty of the Western mind, the beauty of the Western culture, even if not the Western mind, because many, the beauty of America at our best is that everybody's here. But the tech industry is something which is giving this can do-ness. But the fact that there are so many, you know, and there are marvelous things happening, and there are marvelous American corporations who have, you know, the meditation practices, all of that is great. I've been writing books about these things myself for decades. All of these things are great, but I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, when they give a million here and give a million there, when their profits are multi-billions and the problem is multi-billions to achieve, let me tell you what a computer does not have that only we have. A computer does not have conscience, a computer does not have courage, a computer does does not have chutzpah, and a computer cannot meditate. Human beings do that. Human beings say, enough is enough. Human beings say, we will take these extraordinary companies. We will take my work here. We will not be silent. You know, Martin Luther King said, your life begins to end on the day that you are silent about the things that matter most. My sense of this, of this uh, conference has been that everything that has, said, has been said, I celebrate. But there are too many things that have not been said that I must say I personally grieve and that I feel there is a listening for and there's a yearning for. That's what we want. We want significance now. We want significance. That's what Americans want. This is our dharma. Our dharma is to deal with the moral responsibility of being people who are blessed with the gifts of liberty, get blessed with the gifts of this extraordinary responsibility that we get to live in a society like this. But you know what? There is a line in the Bible, God shall not be mocked. And you know what the Course in Miracles says it means? He isn't. And what does that mean? That means karma, cause and effect. Everything do, we do will come back to us. And we all know this in our hearts. You know, I have to tell you something. There are a lot of people here from other countries. And whether they're thinking it or not, people all over the world are looking at us and going, who are these people and what are they thinking? And nothing could be better for the state of our country, and nothing could be better for the state of our world than for people who are part of this particular industry that holds so much promise and that gives so many gifts to turn its attention now in a way that it could do. Because the tech industry is one of the few vortexes on the planet where something like $100 billion the activism that could be generated, the legislation that could be generated, the connectivity among people that could be generated, it started. It's not that I don't value the good stuff, but we got to step it up, ladies and gentlemen. My sense of where everybody is right now, we're all doing some real good stuff or you wouldn't even be here. You wouldn't even be at a conference like this if you weren't already going deep and wanting to dial go wide. Pam Weiss, I think it was the other day, who talked about how the social, the social axis, she was right about talking about horizontal and vertical, because those social axis of this time in history is not about getting a lot of people together to think ultimately shallow thoughts. It's about whoever is able to go deep, deep down. It's a vertical axis. When Vladimir Lenin was asked, they said, how are you going to have a communist revolution? You'll never get the masses to understand these principles. He said, I need 10 good men who understand what I'm talking about. That is the value of a, of a conference like this. The people who are gathered here in this Silicon Valley, if you have a critical mass of people, forget the planet, just a critical mass of people in this neighborhood who say this global poverty thing's got to end, and we can make it end. This starving children thing on a planet where there is not yet at least a dearth of food, this has got to end. We can do it. The question is, just because you can do something, should you do it? That's what the wise person asks. And on that, I think we should. So it's just what everybody's been saying here. It's time for a shift. We're moving from competition to collaboration, from that me to we, from sales to service, from ambition to inspiration. But there's a point to all that. And it's not just so that when you go to work, you have less stress. It's not just so that there is even a better, better dynamic in the corporation so that we're all happier and thriving. All of that is right. But what happens when you become your best self? What happens when you become your best self? What happens when you become your best self? And what happens when I become my best self? We all get together and we take care of business. And it's time for this generation to really take care of business. 
And by business, I don't just mean the tech industry or any other industry. When I say take care of business, is what in the New Testament would be called my father's business. That means the business of the soul, the business of the species. We have these extraordinary powers. Not only can we, but I believe we should. And as we do, what you become is a real human being. What you do, when you do this, you become someone who is embodying everything that this is all about. And then, ladies and gentlemen, you can call yourself truly wise. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.